Our next speaker is um, Tim Standing. I'm going to ask Tim to come up while I try to figure out a way to embarrass him. Um, I mean, introduce him. Um, and Tim has been, uh, has, is, it's funny because every time Tim comes to MacTech Conference, he, uh, he seems to, to come across new ideas for products that he wants to do or ideas that he wants to have or pursue or just projects that are fun or whatever the case may be. Um, and so it's always interesting because sometimes you'll see what's going to happen here with a new product down the road um, just because of where the discussions happen at Mac Tech Conference because of it. So <laughs> It's true. Um, Tim, for those of you that don't know, has been working uh, on the Mac since the days of the 128K. Um, not long after that, he started writing drivers. Um, he's uh, one of the founder, founders? Founders of SoftRate? Uh, yes. founder of yes. SoftRate? Yes. Of, one of the two founders. I, one of the two of founders. I think it was co-founders, yes. right? Yes. Um, and uh, SoftRate does some amazing products um, in there and has been in the industry for a very long time. And they were acquired some years back by OWC. And so now he is at uh, Otherworld Computing and he's the VP of Software Engineering. And um, Tim is going to tell us a little bit about what he sees sort of as 2020 vision. Great. Not 2020 hindsight. No, 2020, 2020 vision. vision. How about a warm welcome here for Tim Standing? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to use these guys. So um, a while back, like 30 years ago, 25 years ago, a friend of mine said, if you start writing drivers for storage, nobody will ever let you do anything else. And <laughs> that is really my life right there. Um, so... Um, there are big changes in storage this year. There's a, a write-protected um, file system for the system, uh, the system volume. There's also a new machine, new tower machine coming out, which has blazingly fast PCIe. So there's a lot of change, and every time there's a lot of change, I certainly, for one, get nervous because it's my business, but people, users get nervous too. So this talk, I'm going to dig into some of the things that might make you feel nervous about Catalina and upcoming uh, technologies, and some things I've sort of, you know, I'm a developer, I'm not an admin, so I sort of sit there and think, okay, what is it that I can help, how can I help people who come to the conference understand something that I can digest really easily that then I can present to them so they can have a better idea of what's going on? Um, and th so that's where this talk started from. Um, there are four things I want to cover. The first is obviously the read-only uh, system volume, which I think is really interesting, has some, caused me some major headaches last week. Um, the next is imaging on Mac OS 10.15. Um, I'm going to revisit the copy on write slowdown problem with APFS volumes that I've talked about last year and the year before. It's a little bit of a repeat. I have a huge favor to ask you guys. And then um, we're going to go into some future hardware. Future hardware mainly from OWC, but it's similar to what other vendors are going to be having. <clears throat> so let's talk first about the read-only file system. The, the th what Apple has been saying for the last two years um, about macOS is their goal, their stated goal, is to make uh, macOS as uh, secure an operating system as iOS is. And iOS has been on two volumes, a system volume and a user data volume, since before APFS. Like, I can't, I don't know if it was the first release or sub, you know, very quickly they moved to that model. And I think it's been a cornerstone for them of having a really secure platform. So the, it was sort of like a, an, it was a surprise, but it was sort of, once you heard it, it made total sense that when they said they're going to move to this uh, lockdown read-only system volume and all the user data on the other volume. And the question is, how did they implement it? And does it make sense? And do, is it a good design? So um, the easiest way for me to describe this, I think, is to show you what the installer does when you take your 1014 volume and install Catalina on it. Um, this is, I'm hoping that everyone can see this. This is the uh, a Macintosh volume, which has got on it um, your system folder, your, um, your, uh, your user folder, uh, slash USR, um, and the subfolders under it. Um, so what happens when uh, the installer starts, the first thing it does is it creates a second volume. Um, it does the complete install of the operating system onto that second volume. Um, can, is it, can everyone see the slide or is it too small? Did I make that mistake? 
What's that? Colors are hard. Okay, good. I'll know next time. Um, so I'm going to, I can't see very well from here either because I've got this little tiny window here. Um, so um, so the, 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 uh, what happens is the, um, the system gets installed and we now have a duplicate file system, a duplicate directory structure on both the original uh, volume, which has been renamed with a dash data on it, and the new volume, which is on the right. So we have slash, we have system library, user uh, inside the system library of the prelink kernel folder. Um, we have uh, user slash bin and user slash local, and we have a users folder, which ha is going to have all the user information in it. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to prune the, um, or the installer is going to prune the original volume. So it's removing everything out of that volume that is OS specific, that is only touched by the installer or the update mechanism. Okay, so this is like the prelink kernel. It's the, the bin, user slash bin, it's user slash s bin. It's a lot of stuff in the system slash libraries folder. Um, all that stuff is gone from the data folder because it, all that stuff is stuff that you don't want to have access to from, you, from a user write perspective, right? You don't want to have anyone have access to it. If you go in and do an ls minus l on the Catalina system uh, folder, you're going to find a lot of stuff which the root access has, gives, you know, the root has that right access to it. But it's just like a, a disk image. If you mount it and it's mounted read only, it doesn't matter if you have write access. You still can't write to it. So it's protected. It's got the ultimate protection. Um, and that, that, you know, the Charles was asked what he thinks of Catalina. I actually am totally in favor of Catalina. I can't wait to get on it. I know it's going to be a headache, but I really am in favor of the added level of security that we're getting from it. I think it's really important for us. Um, okay, so the, the last step is these links, Apple calls them firm links, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit what they are. And it's, you know, typical Apple speak, they give you this sort of airy-fairy term and then they don't quite tell you what's going on. So I, I have, in order for me to remember and work with this stuff, I have to create a mental model. And the, what a firm link is, is it's basically, it can only be between two directories, and it's basically linking two directories such that you can, the contents of one directory is sort of appearing in the other directory. So the content, so if we look here, we have like um, slash users is linked, right? So slash users on the right is the, the read-only system volume. But you actually want to be able to write to that, right? Because that way you have to install a new user, you want to get your mail, you want to save something on the desktop, it's all going to go in there. And you've got to be able to write in there. So the way they do it is they have, they call it a, uh, some sort of wormhole, pseudo wormhole. Anyway, the way I think of it is you have two directories that sort of deal with the same thing. The way that you do with a hard link, you have two file descriptors that point to the same file. So it's the same sort of operation. You have two directories, they both have the same contents, and they both, in this case, the user's directory lives on the data volume, so you can actually write to it even though you're navigating through a directory structure on a read-only volume, okay? Sort of takes a while to get your head around it. Okay, so Apple calls this concept volume groups where you have a system volume and a data volume. Their, their idea is that these volumes should be um, always treated as a unit by the operating system, by the applications, by all the processes, nobody should ever know that that other volume, this, there are two volumes there. They should just sort of magically meld. And from a programming standpoint, when you're running Catalina, it seems pretty much like it works. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, the data volume, the name doesn't matter. You can go and rename it to whatever you want after you created it. Um, the data volume is actually mounted at slash uh, system slash volume, so you can go noodle around in it all you want. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, the diagram I had before with the, the two directory structures, the thing I don't understand is why they have two identical di directory structures on the data volume and the system volume. There's probably some implementation detail that I'm just not pr uh, privy to, um, but I like, the, I like the end result. The end result when you're running Catalina is really clean. 
So let's do a quick review of links. There are two types of links before this, which were hard links, which were um, file only, where you had two different file, um, file entries pointing to the same data, or symbolic links, which were always, which are um, done by path name. They can cross files, they can be files or directories. If you, if you have a symbolic link to a file and then replace it with another file, you're now referencing the new file. Um, so, uh, uh, firm links are sort of like a mixture of both in some weird way. Um, they are directories only. They, are, they reference uh, actual content. Um, and there's, they don't use path names, obviously, because you can change things. Um, so the thing that's interesting is um, they can only be created by system software. Apple's publicly said they're not, uh, they're not gonna expose anything about them. Um, it's actually a new file system object, which is why uh, 1014 and 1013 don't recognize them and you see the two volumes. So the interesting thing happens, if you, if you know how um, Mac OS boots up, how the kernel gets loaded, it used to be the kernel would load and then after the kernel loaded, uh, the drivers would get loaded one by one from the, the system slash library extensions folder and they would get linked in, in real time and it would take you 20 or 30 seconds to boot up your machine. And then lo and behold, Apple said, hey, let's make this, we have to do it every time you start up. So why, and people don't change their extensions very often, so we'll just make one big pre-linked blob that has all the drivers and the kernel all linked together and then we can just suck that in off the disk, bam, we're there, we can boot up, we, sh we save all this disk access matching and all this other crap and it just happens. So there's now a pre-linked kernel, right? So if I was gonna design OS and I wanted to be really secure, I would want my pre-linked kernel to be not on a writable file system, I would want it to be on the read-only file system, right? But the problem is you wanna be able to have users update their drivers, right? You have a third, like us, we have a RAID driver, you come out with a new version, it's got some new cool feature, you want it to be able to use it. So there's a catch-22 here. You wanna be able to modify it, but you want it to be read-only. So how do you get around that? And I think a Apple's solution is actually really elegant. Um, the people who do Lil Snitch, his blog entry, uh, went through a description of a bug that, um, came, that we realized on Monday evening of last week when Catalina shipped. We had to fix our workaround two days later. He published the blog entry over the weekend. Apple fixed it on this last Monday. So in seven days, they fixed the most, the most egregious bug, that, egregious bug that, I, that I saw in, in Catalina. I was pretty impressed by how quickly they did that. So um, here, this is sort of how Apple uh, has worked around the problem. In, and, and part of this is stuff they have always been doing. The last step is the thing that's new. So uh, there's a daemon called KexD. It's always running. It's looking for modifications in either um, slash system slash library slash kernels or in the place where Apple drivers or third-party drivers are stored. And I think it's, judging by how long things take, how long you have to wait before you restart, I think it checks about every 10 seconds. Um, and when it sees a change, it kicks off a process and it calls KexCache. You probably know KexCache because you use it whenever you can't boot a machine or can't load a driver, you do kex dash minus i for invalidate slash sudo kexcache uh, minus i slash and then you wait for it to do its stuff and then you restart and then magically your kernel extension loads correctly. So Apple's doing the same thing with KexD. They build a pre-linked kernel. They stick it in uh, the slash libraries folder, which is uh, slash library slash Apple, um, where they can store it because it's on a writable file system. Well, that doesn't do you any good, right? Because it's on a writable file system, it doesn't, you don't have any security. So the magic comes in the next step, which is what happens at shutdown. At shutdown, remember that on Mac OS, every process is started by launch D. It's the, it's the process zero. So it, uh, at shutdown, it, you know, if you run in verbose mode, you often see you know, terminating all processes, you know, all the, the entries that have come across. So it terminates all processes, and the next thing it does is it unmounts the system volume and it mounts it read-write. 
Okay, so it's mounting at read-write, but it has already determined that there are no other processes running, so it's a relatively secure environment to mount the system volume rewrite. Then it calls um, a script called shove kernel, which is all of three lines long. Shove kernel just calls KC ditto. KC ditto just copies from this libraries folder into the pre-linked uh, storage folder in the read-only file system. Remember, it's read-write at this point, and then it just starts the reboot, and after the reboot, it comes up, and it's that, that read-only that read file system is now read-only, and you've magically taken your modified kernel driver blob and stuck it into the read-only file system. Hats off to them. I think they did a really cool job on that. So um, imaging on Mac OS 10, 15. So, I was at um, a conference a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to people and saying, hey, you know, what's the deal with imaging? And it's like, oh, imaging's dead. And I'm thinking, well, I remember something from the developers conference. So I started digging into it, and um, Apple has a solution for Catalina. It works when I try it. Um, again, I'm not a admin, I'm a developer. So there may be something really obvious I'm missing here, so please come tell me. I'm a little nervous talking about it because you guys are much more experts than I am at this. Um, but anyway, I think it's an interesting story, so I thought it was interesting to put in the talk. Um, the talk that uh, at, was at WWDC is available on the web. It's a 35-minute talk. The last 20 minutes or 15 minutes is iOS. So there's just like literally 10 minutes of talk about um, imaging. It took me about two days to sort of untangle it all and get it to work. But when it was working, it's, you know, it's there's one place that gets messed up, but it's a user error problem, so I can't blame Apple. Um, so let's do a little bit of review. Here's a disk, which we have. It's got an EFI partition at the very beginning. It's got an APFS partition with an APFS container in it. If we look at the container, what we see is we see, this is Catalina, so we have the system volume, we have the data volume in the, or user volume in the, the impossible to read green. That's what the white little text says. I will learn my lesson. Um, there's a pre-boot boot volume and there's a recovery volume. And Catalina requires all four of these volumes in order to start up. If it doesn't have them, it doesn't start up. So this looks great. It's really easy, really clean. But the problem is, remember all these volumes are sharing the same container. So they don't actually look like this. No, they look like this. Right? You have a little block of here, and then you've got to block something else, and depending on what order everything got written, it's scattered all over hell. So this whole idea of doing an image where you're going to do an image of a volume, that's non-contiguous. The cool thing is that HDI Util, the tool for creating images, got rewritten so it understands APFS. There's probably a backdoor into the APFS file system, and, there, and you're able to do something like this where you can image a volume in a container into a, a, an image file where everything becomes contiguous. It's their recommended way of defragging a volume, so they might actually be reading extents you know, in sequence. Um, the problem is it's great for doing a single volume, but as I said, we need four volumes to make a bootable system, right? So are we going to run, are we going to do four separate restores? Oh, that would be awful. It, it works really well if you've got a, you know, an external volume, you want to clean it up, you want to make an image of it. But for, for a bootable image, uh, not going to work. But remember what I said at the beginning, which was Apple's, wants, Apple's goal is to make the imaging system, make this new volume structure of these volume groups, make it transparent to the user. And they've taken this all the way into HDI Util and into ASR. Okay, which I think is really cool. So to, to image and restore a startup volume is three steps. It's probably really obvious to those of you who have done it for years and years, and this is like the first week I've done it. So um, it's find the APFS container. So the only requirement here is that you image the entire container, not the volume. So everything I say from here out about imaging startup volumes, you've got to image the whole container. It will compress it. So if you have a large container and you're only using, if you have a 400 gig container and you're only using 15 gigs of it, it's going to be a 15 gig image. It's not going to be 400 gigs. Um, so we need to find the container, the BSD disk number of the container. We need to create the image and then we can restore. Um, so the first thing we do is a disk util list. Um, we, we see the 
I've outlined here the block of disks that are part of one container. This is disk six. It has a bootable volume, which I call Little Fish. I've named it Little Fish. It has a data volume called Little Fish Data. It has the boot and the recovery volume. It also has a VM volume. We don't have to worry about VM because um, Apple, the OS, will create a new VM uh, volume if it needs it, if it isn't there. We do have to worry about the others because all, they all need to be populated. Um, so uh, the thing that I always I kept missing this was <laughs> you drag the, the volume, you're running Catalina, you drag the volume of your target or your source volume, volume to the trash, and then it doesn't work. You know, HDIHL barfs and it gives you some, you know, pretty weird error that doesn't really tell you what's going on. It turns out that some part of the OS is keeping one of these other three volumes mounted behind your back. So the really simple solution is disk util, unmount disk, the disk number for the container, and if it says, you know, it says resource busy, my, the error message I love so much, um, you just say disk util, unmount disk, space force, and then the disk number, and boom, it's all unmounted, and you're ready to go. And that's really the, I, I ran over this an, an alarmingly, you know, embarrassing number of times, but this is actually the, the hardest part I had in the whole process. So um, then we create our image with HDI, sudo HDI util create minus uh, source device, SRC device, the disk number of the container, um, and then the target where we're going, in this case I'm going to the desktop, 1015.dmg. Um, it doesn't take very long, it's, you know, I was running on a relatively slow USB um, SSD connected to my laptop and it took, you know, maybe five minutes to do. Um, so then we need to prepare the image. This is um, something that anyone who's run ASR is familiar with it. ASR um, image scan, minus minus source, and then the destination. Uh, I think it's just checking, making a, making a checksum, and doing some other manipulation so that ASR can use it. Um, and then we need to, so in, in the case where we're actually, there are two ways we can go about this. We can either take a container and blow away every volume in there and put our new volume into that container. So we replace all the other stuff in there, or we can take a volume in that container and replace the contents, its contents with the, what's in the image. So it's either replace everything in the container or replace one volume in the container. The first example I have is of replacing everything in the container. So this will get rid of absolutely everything in that container. Whatever is there, it's gone. Um, if you're imaging a machine to start from scratch for a new, new, new employee, this is the way to go, obviously. Um, again, don't forget disk util force. Um, and in this case, I'm using disk five, which is the, the, disk, the BSD disk number for the container. So it's just a, a ASR restore minus minus source, the path to the source, uh, minus minus target, the uh, slash dev slash R disk five, and then all of the restores for ASR for APFS need a minus minus erase, meaning we're gonna destructively uh, get rid of everything there. If we wanna do instead just restore a single disk, um, I mean, a single volume, we need to get the BSD node for the volume. In this case, is disk 6S5. Um, it's the volume I call other fish. It only has 1.1 megs in it, so it's, it's basically empty. Um, and then it's the exact same command. We just use a different disk number in the minus minus target parameter. And then that empty volume now is bootable. And the cool thing is I did all this testing on a seven-year-old uh, 2012 Mac Mini but I made sure the volumes that I created were bootable on an iMac Pro, a T2 machine. Because at first I thought, oh, there's gonna be some problem where it's not gonna work on a T2 machine because there's the T2 does all, you know, as I covered last year, does, gets you know, in the way of all sorts of things. As long as you can boot the machine with an external device, you haven't made it so it only boots internal, it'll work fine. It works, and I tested it with SIP because I wanna make sure that SIP was not, you know, it was one of the things, these things you've gotta turn SIP off to make it work. Um, no, it works fine with SIP, it's pretty cool. So um, if you want to restore only one volume out of a container, you can do that as well. So if you want to have, say, one image that's for a classroom and one volume on the image is, um, is for students and one's for teachers, then you could make, you can make, your you can make your disk 
your source disk before you started with the two volumes, set them up exactly how you want, make an image of the entire container, and then you can just use ASR and target a particular volume in that image to go to your destination depending on whether you're preparing it for a teacher or a student. So um, it's really relatively easy. It's ASR info minus minus source. Gives you a list of all the volumes in there. You're going to look for the volumes that do not say dash data on them because you want the volumes that are actually are the system volumes, not the um, data volumes. In this case, I am using other fish. Um, I always like to use the UUID because I've been bitten a couple times about using the volume name and having another volume. You know, you do the same process a couple times and you end up with a volume that's a target and then things get confused and so it's easier for me just to always use the UUID. So you grab the UUID and then you just do um, SR restore minus minus source uh, minus minus source volume UUID where UUID is capitalized. Um, the UUID of the volume and then minus minus target the a uh, path to the target and the minus minus erase, and it goes. The really cool thing about this, it takes about two minutes to do a restore. It's really cool, it's so much faster. So for years and years we've had in the, our lab disk images which um, were on the server and we could you know, go up to any machine, plug in a, a USB drive, boot up, and then run a script to set up the machine. So literally in two and a half to three minutes I could take any machine, have it boot any O version of the OS that it supported. And the last two years have been crazy because every time we want to do that, it's like wait for the installer and you know, then apply the updates and you know, 20 minutes later you're finally doing the test you want to do. So the cool thing is we're now on, with this, I know I can with Catalina, I can just say, oh yeah, that machine and Catalina, boom, I'm there. So I'm really excited about it, literally two minutes and this was not on a super fast machine. Um, so the other thing that they talked about, which I was sort of a little skeptical because I wasn't sure it was going to work or how it was going to work, is you can restore snapshots. You can restore from a snapshot to what they call the live volume, which is the, what you see on the desktop, what's actually running. So, and all you have to do is you create a snapshot the way you do normally with TMUtil. You get the snapshot ID with using a TMUtil list local snapshots, then the path to the volume. Um, in this case, my volume is not my boot volume because I'm, I'm not imaging my boot volume. I, I'm working from another volume, imaging a, a volume that I've set up the way I wanted. Um, then when you want to do restore, the only additional parameters you need are um, you need the source volume ID because the snapshot ID is totally irrelevant unless you have a volume that you're pointing to. So we have source volume UUID, and then you need a two snapshot um, again, notice the weird capitalization. Um, two snapshot and then the snapshot ID. And again, so if you have like four snapshots in your, in your container, uh, you can choose one of those snapshots and say, hey, I want that one. That's the one I want to have on this machine. And that's what you end up with. You end up with that snapshot. It's really cool. So the other thing they were talking about, which at first I was really excited about, was you can do deltas between two snapshots. And I thought, God, this is really cool. You could take um, a, a version of like Catalina and then install like some software package, do a second snapshot, do one before, one after, and then image the delta onto your target machine. Wouldn't that be great? Well, yeah, except the problem is what you end up with on the target machine is what the second snapshot was, which means that you've been working on some like killer blockbuster movie or a presentation or, or the documents for your IPO or something. They are all gone when you're done. So it doesn't seem very useful to me. Maybe someone can come up with a reason to use it. I thought it was a really cool sort of uh, demonstration of technology, but it wasn't really something I was going to be wanting to use. So in summary, images, uh, image and restore seems to work fine for, um, for a single volume to defragment it. It seems to work fine for um, bootable volumes. Uh, un unmounting all the volumes in the container is a must and it's the place that I got messed up. Um, and ASR will create both volumes in the volume group plus the, uh, the pre-boot volume plus the recovery volume. So um, I've talked about this topic last year, and I believe the year before. I want to go over it again because I need your help on it. 
So for people who haven't been he heard me talk before, the problem is with APFS volumes on HDDs, um, very quickly because of copy and write, you can get massive uh, fragmentation. And um, that can lead to real performance problems. And I'll quickly go through uh, an example. So when copying files on HFS, we have a file here. It's got two discontiguous blocks on the disk. It's a 10 gig file. The two blocks are called extents. Um, when I duplicate the file, all I do is I copy what's in each of those extents to a totally different part of the disk, which my, other, my copy of the file points to. Um, and then if I go and edit the first file, all I'm going to do is overwrite what was in the, the extents for the first file. There's no extra fragments. The re access time is exactly the same as it was before. Everything's fine. But it did take me a while to do that copy, right? Um, so with APFS, it's a little different because we start off in the same situation. We have one file, two extents. When we do the copy, the copy happens really quickly because it's sort of like almost like a hard link. We have a new file that points to the extents that the original file had, right? So, so we've got now two files. They point to the same parts of the disk. What happens when I want to write to it? I, I've got to maintain, at that point, the distinction between the two files. If I write to the first file, what I have to do is um, uh, I have to um, copy the parts that I'm writing to a new location on the disk. And then I have to change the extents table so it now points to those new parts uh, for the only the first file. So the second file still points to the two blocks just contiguously. The first file, when it it points to the, the original file up to the point where there's a new piece of data written. And then it has to go point over here and read that part. And at the end of that part, it has to come back to the part that was no longer overwritten and read to the next overwritten part and then go over here. Well, every time it's doing that, that head is swinging back and forth, right? So the fastest drives now are four milliseconds to do that head swing each direction. So you're eight to go there and back, right? Um, Maybe it takes six, or maybe it takes 10. You know, it's going to take a long time to go back and forth. SSDs, you don't see it because the amount of time to move from one part of an SSD to another is four, four microseconds. You know, you're a thousand times faster. It's, it's so small, it sort of gets lost in the noise. Um, the experiment that I showed last year was comparing the amount of time it takes to read a 10 gig file with varying amounts of discontiguous writes in them. And as you can see, the HFS on HFS volume, you can go up to 10,000 writes, which is the far um, right-hand cor corner, and there's no change in performance, which is exactly what you expect. With APFS on rotating media disk on HDDs, it goes up, you know, you're probably eight times slower. So uh, an array, this was all done on a four drive RAID 0 array that was doing 500, 600 megabytes a second. It's doing, you know, 60 or 70 by the end of this test. Um, and the question is, you know, do people notice this or not? We have customers who, uh, especially people who run VMware or VMs on parallels, they use it for a week and they're saying, God, it's so slow, what's wrong? And some of them have figured out, oh yeah, I've got to copy it off this volume and copy it back on. And it's all because either they're using Time Machine, they're using Carbon Copy Cloner, they're using some mechanism that's invoking this copy on write mechanism. So the thing I want to ask all of you is, I have, I've talked to Apple for three years about this. And the response has gotten from, you don't, well, you know, works as designed, which is always my favorite response, to um, the most recent was, was um, the head of APFS says, well, we're not really going to do anything about it. The pro-marketing people say, uh, what did he say? He said, um, well, nobody actually edits uh, uh, video on local storage. They only do it on NAS. Okay, great, this is the response I want. We sell thousands of boxes, literally thousands of boxes a month with multi-drive enclosures with hard disks in them. Are these people not using them? So we're gonna move to APFS in the next three or four months, um, Softraid will, and what I want you to do is if you have any contact at Apple, if you have a developer account, you do send feedback with Feedback Assistant, enter a bug in, talk to people, tell them that, that it's gotta change, because I can't do it alone. And I need people like you to get in touch with whoever you know at Apple, your account manager, your service person, anyone, and start talking to them about this. 
because otherwise it's never going to be fixed. It's a relatively easy fix. All, you know, if you do use CP on the t command line, CP, because of the way the posit spe spec is written, actually does a block by block, block copy. You've got new blocks. So it doesn't invoke this problem. The only person, the, it's the finder, it's carbon copy cloner, but I think they're doing the right thing, but it is carbon copy cloner. It's time machine. That's basically it. Th those are the three offenders. So um, I'm sure there are other backup utilities which will start using it, but it, it would be really easy to have a flag in there that said, hey, this is guy wrote. In fact, there is already a flag that says solid state media true. And all you have to say is if solid state media is not true, then don't do copy and write. Problem solved. Be great. So let's, um, let's start talking a little bit about future hardware. Um, <coughs> wait a minute, Fire 400, future hardware? <laughs> um, so I, I want to bring this, I sort of want to do a little bit of a segue about hardware because we think of hardware as digital ones and zeros, right? We always think of it, oh, yeah, it's reliable, it's, it's one or zero, you know, there's nothing in between. And, and when I first heard about the technology that's in FireEye 400, I've actually heard, heard about it when I was working on Fiber Channel, one gigahertz Fiber Channel. Um, if you think about what came before FireEye 400, it was parallel SATA, right, and SCSI, and we have ribbon cables, and each ribbon cable had, uh, had lines on it which were signal lines and, and ground lines, right? Well, it turned out as we started to go faster and faster and faster, that didn't work anymore because the interference from one line to another meant that the ground line that was two wires away from the signal line might be getting different noise. So what came down the, the signal line would be different. And the solution was to, to turn from you know, everything relative to ground to differential pairs where you're just measuring, for each signal you're measuring the difference in voltage between two wires. And the wires are twisted together, and they're twisted together in such a way that they both get the same amount of interference. So since you're not measuring from ground up, if both wires go up or down a little bit, it doesn't matter because you're just measuring the difference. And it's really cool, but the problem it turns out to be that if you do that and you start sending a whole bunch of ones down the wire, you can lose track of how many ones you've got. So you have to recode it so that you don't have a long you have a run of maybe four ones, and no more than four runs, and then you force a transition. So that's the first problem. The second problem is if you run a whole bunch, even if you're doing that you know, transitioning at the right interval, if you end up with, over a period of time, more ones than zeros, i.e. one wire is positive more than the other, you end up building a voltage in there. And you have a, a static voltage in the wire, and what happens when you have two conductors close to each other with a voltage? they become a capacitor. And it turns out that because they become a capacitor, it really messes with the signal. So they had to come up with a solution to keep from having too many ones or too many zeros going at one time. And the solution they came up with is called 10B, 8B encoding. And what it means is for every eight bits you want to code on the wire, you're going to take 10 bits to do it. And the 10, so it, in effect, every 8-bit number can be encoded two or three or four ways. And the, num the way that you choose is dependent on how many ones or zeros you've shipped down the wire in the previous unit of time. And it works really well, and it's been the basis of, it's in FireWire, it's in PCIe, it's in Fiber Channel, it's in Thunderbolt, it's used all over the place. And it was a really cool solution. But it explains something that really bugged me for, until I figured it out. FireWire 400, so it's 400 megahertz, right? You know, algebra, eight, 400 divided by eight is 50, right? But FireWire 400, it goes 40 megabytes a second. Where was that extra 10 megabytes? Now you know, divide by 10, not by eight, okay? And the same is true of PCIe 2. Um, it's the same all the way across the board. If you look at uh, um, Thunderbolt, it's 40, 40 gigahertz but the f underlying transmission is that you're sending uh, four gigabytes, right? Divide by 10 because of the eight, eight bit. Um, okay, so now let's look a little bit at PCI bus speeds. Um, this is, uh, the first bar is one lane. The blue is PCI two, the um, uh, yellow is PCI three. 
The PCI2 is roughly 500 megabytes a second per lane. PCI3 is just under a gigabyte a second. So um, this gets sort of exciting when you start thinking about, you know, the, all the, the cheese grater max, the towers that we all love because Apple came out with something that wasn't so useful, um, th those are all PCI2, right? So if you have eight lanes in there, you're, you're basically looking at four gigabytes a second max. Um, if you're on eight lanes on a new machine, on the PCI3 machine, then you're looking at almost eight gigabytes a second, which is sort of cool. Um, so let's go look a little bit at Thunderbolt 3. Thunderbolt 3 is, has four PCIe 3 lanes on it. In theory, this should be just under four gigabytes a second, but the standards committee or whoever said that uh, DisplayPort had to have guaranteed bandwidth. Um, so it's got this 1.2 megabytes of guaranteed bandwidth, which leaves us 1.2.7 uh, for storage. So um, Thunderbolt 3 is really cool. I really like it. Um, it's great for storage. Um, but I think the really exciting thing is with the new Mac Pro, we're going to start seeing solutions that are significantly faster than what we could have ever imagined on Thunderbolt. Um, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is this device. Well, this device looks like a standard SATA SSD, right? It's actually not. It's a U2, U.2 SSD. And U.2 is, think of it as an NVMe blade in a um, two and a half inch SSD case. So the cool thing about it is you can put a lot more chips in there than you can on one of those puny little blades. It's um, something where if you drop your pen on it, you're not going to break it. And it's thermally connected to a large piece of aluminum, so you can put it in an enclosure and have a fan blow over it and actually cool a decent amount of chips. So the problem with it is, until now, it's been almost exclusively data center. So it's single layer SLC uh, flash. Um, the last time I checked, the Intel ones were uh, like $3,500 for four gigabytes. I mean, it's crazy expensive. It's just nuts. But what we're going to see is in the next year or in the next six months, this is going to move downstream into the Macintosh market um, because this type of performance is what you're going to be able to take advantage of in a machine where you can put a card in and then put a couple of these devices in, right? If you're, if you're sitting on the outside of, of uh, you know, Thunderbolt, one of these, and you're going to swamp Thunderbolt. There's no reason to do anything complicated. It's just a waste of time. But you put two or three of these into a 16-lane slot, whew, cool. So the next device I want to talk about is, um, this, is um, this is going into a little bit of the OWC plug sec session, section of the thing, and then Bashley. Um, this is a product we came out with, um, I think it was, let's see, a year and a half ago. We shipped it for about four months. We had problems with it. We stopped shipping it. We went and found a new flash memory uh, supplier in Taiwan. Um, ever since then, we've been really happy with the product, and customers have been too. Won the best of show at, in a couple categories at NAB. Um, comes in sizes from one to eight terabytes, and it has no fan, so it's completely quiet. The same blade, so this, this device will do two, uh, about two, just over two gigabytes a second reading and writing. The same four blades put into this device give you over six gigabytes a second. So this, we, we, we know it'll do six gigabytes a second because we can test it on a PC. We haven't yet um, had access to the, um, the 2019 Mac uh, Pro. I'm hoping that's going to change over the next couple weeks. Um, from what I hear from other vendors who have, who have been able to have access to it, the performance on the new Mac Pro and the performance on the Windows machines are roughly in parallel. So we expect six gigabytes a second on this. And that's like six gigabytes a second all day long. Run AGA to system test, continuous mode, come back the day later, it's still doing the same speed. Um, the next product I'm really excited about is uh, we have an eight, eight drive enclosure coming out. Um, it uses a next generation SATA interface chip. So the, all the old SATA interface chips were PCIe 2. Remember, so that's 500 megabytes per second per lane. This is using PCIe 3, so we sh should see significantly higher performance. Should be available at the end of the year. This is just representative of um, what type of performance we're seeing. So the left-hand side is RAID 0, the right-hand side is RAID 5. 
what you'll see with a lot of hardware vendors is they, hardware raid vendors is they do really great performance, but this, this is AJA system tests run with 64 gigabyte files. So uh, a lot of the tests that you'll see, um, they use much smaller files because they only have a four gig RAM cache. And if you do a 64 big gig file, you'll see it go along really fast and then it drops down to five or 600 megabytes a second for the rest, the, the rest of the 60 gigabytes. So it might be fine if you're doing edits, but if you're doing ingest, it's not gonna work. Um, the last product I wanna talk about is a little bit further out, it's called Thunder Bay 8 Flex. Um, this uses the U.4, has four U.2 slots. It has four um, SATA sl SAS slots. It's also got DisplayPoint 1.4. So it'll support an 8K monitor. Uh, it's got a 16-lane PCI card. It's got CF Express, USB 3 and USB-C. Obviously, that's all going through Thunderbolt 3, so the Thunderbolt 3 connection is gonna be the bottleneck. You're not gonna get all 16 lanes of bandwidth through a cable that only gives you four. But for, for an ingest solution or something else, it could be a really great solution for, um, for, for uh, for a one, one device solution for like a DAT card or something. Um, so I hope I've allayed your fears about Catalina and storage and the, start, the read-only startup volume. Uh, as soon, I, was I really wanted to put it on my machine last week, but I thought, hey, I'm doing a presentation next week. And the last thing I wanna have to worry about is my machine not working. So um, I'm actually going to uh, probably tonight or tomorrow move over to it, move my projects over to Xcode 11, uh, dot one and start working on it. I'm really excited. I read enough in Ars Technica about malware. I go to conferences and I hear um, people talking about exploits. And my biggest, you know, it used to be that I would really rag on Apple for user interface, blah, blah, blah. I really like what they're doing in the kernel. I really, I, it's gonna be a major headache for me over the next couple years as I have to rewrite the, you know, rewrite parts of software to accommodate what's happening but I really like what they're doing and I like what they're doing with developer tools and I'll give them a pass on some of the really stupid things that happen in the UI. Thank you. <laughs> so I, so I have one more thing to say, which is before Neil comes up and, you can come up, come on. So, so um, I come here, I say this every year, but I come here to talk to people and to hear what people say about our products, about SoftRaid, um, you know, I have had, like in years past, people come up and say, you know, I had this one real problem with software, I had a really bad uh, experience with them. I wanna hear those as well as the good ones, okay? We have a new flash vendor partly because of what customers said about our old flash vendor. So we wanna listen to you, we wanna incorporate your suggestions, we wanna incorporate feedback. The first thing I do when I leave here, I write an email to the president, my boss, and the owner and say, hey, you know, like when I was in Sweden, someone said, hey, you know, your, your, um, your portable USB-C dock, it has an SD card on it, why don't you take the SD card on, which nobody, practically nobody needs, and put an ethernet port in there? Because then it would actually be really great and I have one less dog to carry around. So that feedback went straight back to engineering and went straight back to management. So any, you know, if you wanna have an, uh, so an ear inside OWC for ideas, I'm the person. And I'm gonna be here until Friday at six, so. He's here all week, folks. I am. And, and unlike like this morning when I was upstairs doing this, the third run through on my talk, I don't have to worry about that anymore, so I can relax. No, so now what happens is that if you're not like around at breakfast time, then we know that you've just installed Catalina. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be down here with my laptop trying to get help from you guys. There you go. We're so good at it. There you go. <laughs> How about a uh, really big round of applause here for Tim? Thank you.